I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest is Thomas Messer, the director of the Guggenheim Museum. Thank you for having us here. Tom Messer was born in Czechoslovakia, went to college in Pennsylvania, returned to Europe under the auspices of the US Army, worked briefly as a secretary to a Wall Street broker before going on to museums in New York, excuse me, in New Mexico, and in Boston. For the last 15 years, he has been the director of the Guggenheim Museum. Perhaps we should start by your telling us what the unique character of this museum is. What is its history, its purpose? What makes the Guggenheim different from other museums? Well, the Guggenheim was created in 1937, only that it wasn't called the Guggenheim Museum then. It was called the Museum for Non-Objective Painting. And uh, therein is really its history, because the original idea of uh, my distant predecessor, a lady named Hilary Bay, the Baroness Hilary Bay, uh, who came from Germany to the United States, was intent to uh, explain to Mr. Guggenheim and through the institution that she eventually formed to the pu public at large, the uh, importance and uh, the viability of this new kind of painting, which uh, did not show any images, and which was called abstract or non-objective more precisely. Now, of course, that kind of painting was not new in 1937. It was new at best in 1913 uh, or 1912, uh, when Kandinsky and others uh, first had the idea and the capacity to uh, create works of art, to create images that did not reflect, that did not refer to the world of common experience. The first improvisations and uh, impressions and compositions uh, that Kandinsky, among others, created at that time, uh, importantly broke with the history of painting as a essentially descriptive art and made it enter its musical phase. In other, in other words, it, uh, it presumed, and it was a presumption at the time, to convey meanings through structures, forms, volumes, colors, alone just as music does. And this notion, of course, was uh, revolutionary, to put it mildly, was not taken for granted as it is today. And uh, Hilary Bay wished to be introduced to a very rich American, was introduced to Harry Guggenheim, painted his portrait because she was a painter herself, a good uh, academic painter at first, and eventually a fervent disciple of non-objective art, and gradually persuaded Mr. Guggenheim, that was Solomon R. Guggenheim, to uh, create the museum, uh, which uh, in its first, uh, oh, uh, about 15 years, uh, existed modestly in an old converted brownstone house, and which eventually, after her time, at the time of my predecessor, James Johnson Sweeney, uh, moved into a building that Frank Lloyd Wright had had on the boards for a good 14 years, something like that, until it bloomed in fullness on, on Fifth Avenue and was opened in 1959. It's not accidental that you use musical references. Much of your early life was spent deeply involved with music. How did you end up a museum director? Well, I would have to tell my life story at considerably greater detail than you have just started, and I think I'd, I'd rather spare the audience. And well, how did you make the shift from actually a secretary to a Wall Street broker to a museum in New Mexico? Well, the secretary to the Wall Street broker shouldn't be exaggerated. I spent about five miserable months there, and everybody shouted at me continuously because I have no sense for figures and a terrible time, a, a terrible habit of transposition. In other words, if you tell me 364, I 
respond by 462 and something Only like that. Trustees. Well, no, I'm a little bit on our own budgets, but uh, but it was almost tragic for Wall Street uh, purposes, as you can imagine. So I didn't last long. But uh, <clears throat> to come back to the to the original disposition, uh, I grew up in a, a rather bohemian surrounding bohemian in two senses, uh, partly because the, the Czech part of Czechoslovakia is so referred to, but also because my uh, uncle was a composer and my father was a, a professor of uh, art history and Germanistic, and uh, so uh, all of this was around me, <clears throat> except that it seemed for a while that unlike my whole family, I might embrace what was referred to as, a, as an honorable profession, in our family, and every effort was made to scare me away from the arts and into other more dependable and more lucrative areas. And so I studied chemistry for many, many years, first in my home country, and then when I came over here as an exchange student. And uh, simultaneously, of course, I proceeded with the only thing that interested me at, the, at that time, which was music in the first place, uh, literature, art secondarily, and so gradually I couldn't find my way out of the labyrinth and ended in another labyrinth, the Gunther Museum. <clears throat> Who determines what is exhibited in this museum? What makes a work of art qualify? And I don't mean procedurally, but actually. You mean any work of art? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think your question would have to be answered at least on two levels, and I'm sure that I'll forget the second when I Lower get there, but if you remind me. Uh, well, on the abstractly aesthetic level, uh, what is beauty and so on, this is a terribly complicated question. And uh, if I were forced into a capsule answer on that, as evidently I am, uh, I would say that a work of art uh, uh, has to have evidence of uh, uh, a uh, notion, a thought of sufficient weightiness, of sufficient uniqueness, of sufficient uh, gravity uh, to come out in other terms than a commonplace. Uh, anybody can paint, and uh, there are many people who can paint well. It is uh, not rare that the craft of painting is uh, uh, well assimilated by people who spend enough time uh, to uh, study it, to say something through this craft, to say something that is analogous to a new thought, let us say, to a thought that a philosopher may have, through which uh, our awareness, our sensibility, our whole comprehension of life is somehow affected, is an extremely great rarity, and that would qualify it aesthetically uh, for, that would overqualify it almost for acceptance in a museum. Uh, the other thing, and I do remember, uh, what forces uh, move in order to make it acceptable in, uh, in a public institution, that is uh, such a uh, messy situation that I, I can hardly hope to even reconstruct it. I was on a panel uh, maybe a year ago in which uh, the audience was greatly activated by the suspicion of collusion. Uh, Is that the validating modern art? That was that, yes. And six of us, six museum directors from all parts of the world were sitting there uh, like uh, accused prisoners uh, and were asked uh, how this collusion is worked and how we really get together with the critics, with the dealers, uh, with other museum colleagues, with collectors to contrive the acceptance of a work of art. and. Uh, I said at that time that I'm more aware in the art world of collision than I'm of collusion because uh, the fact is that there is no uh, dark secret, there is no intention that we deliberately, cunningly, or knowingly uh, share and exchange. Uh, having said this, I, I don't mean to say that there are not nevertheless uh, all sorts of pressures and, and, uh, and forces and, and somehow uh, tacit moves, uh, indefinable, that, that uh, exert pressures upon all of us. None of us stand in this world alone. 
uh, we are all part of a larger texture to which we are responsive. So I don't mean to, uh, to raise my hands in, in horror at the thought that we do not always act uh, in uh, solitary uh, splendor and that we do, uh, to some extent, base our judgment also upon what others think and say and do. One of the most widely discussed questions in the art world is the future and the function of museums. Some see the museum's purpose to conserve, others to exhibit. Some see museums as being decentralized, others as a citadel. I'd be interested to know what your view is and what you see as the role of museums in general and the Guggenheim in particular. That's all. Well, let's try to distinguish between functions that um, most museums have in common and those that are particular to certain species, like a modern museum and eventually to the Guggenheim alone. Uh, I think all museums have the primary responsibility to uh, care for works that are in their custody. If uh, museums are understood as repositories of values, graphic and plastic values, then the first thing that they have to do is uh, to be sure that these things don't get lost, don't get uh, alienated in an illegitimate way, uh, do not get uh, damaged and uh, otherwise disappear. If they do not fulfill that function, they have betrayed, it seems to me, their first charge. Beyond the uh, conservation aspect, of course, there is the obligation upon most museums to build collections and to add to what they have, uh, because m very few museums come into being in a complete state. Most of them uh, start with somebody's collection and gradually grow and enlarge uh, until they have a format uh, that uh, becomes recognizable. So I would say conservation, uh, acquisition, and then, of course, the use of it in exhibition form, uh, above all, uh, the uh, attention to it in documentation form, that is, the writing of catalogues and the, the full explanation of what these works are and what their context is within larger awareness. These are all areas that I think all museums have in common. The modern museum, so-called, uh, is uh, something of an anomaly. Uh, Gertrude Stein told uh, Alfred Barr, who uh, went to visit her before he started the Museum of Modern Art, that what he's trying to do is uh, very precarious because she said, you can be a museum or you can be modern, but you cannot be a modern museum. <laughs> and her insight, uh, even though we seem to have on the surface disproved uh, her uh, intuition, her insight was correct because the difficulty is that modern museums, and I mean now everybody, not only the modern, but the Whitney, the Guggenheim, many other museums of the type, uh, the difficulty that these museums have is the cleavage between uh, our responsibilities to the past, to culture, and to a creative presence, to say nothing of the future. So. Uh, uh, the modern museum, of course, uh, has less of a preserving and more of a utilitarian function. We have to look around, we have to find out uh, what exists, not only what has been art, but what we think may become art. All of these are uh, tricky aspects uh, linked to, uh, to the modern institution. I would say that uh, the success of, let us say, something like the Guggenheim rests primarily upon the uh, distinction of its offerings and that, of course, one hopes that in a city like New York uh, such distinctions can involve uh, a great many spectators and participants. Uh, but if for one reason or another only a few come and the thing itself is, is uh, defensible and valuable, I uh, am content. It's a rather minority view, I guess, in that argument of box office versus scholarship. It is not only a minority, but it is also difficult to sustain because, of course, we have got to live. Uh, 
as an institution, and it is not entirely besides the point whether the public supports us or not. So it is a, a difficult argument, but we are talking in terms of, of broad principles here. A number of museum directors and the art community in general has been talking for some time and talks more and more about the power struggles that go on within museums. I'm referring to the conflict that has taken place in a number of museums between the director and the voluntary heads, the presidents, and the boards. Are these conflicts as widespread as we hear about? Well, I think that you can say that the conflict between uh, lay boards and uh, professionals uh, exist and have existed for a long time, and that they are inherent in our system. Uh, unlike the European cultural uh, system, which is essentially one of uh, state control and uh, state guidance, uh, our system is private and uh, is based precisely on a partnership uh, between uh, a uh, philanthropic and public element within society on the one hand and the uh, professional museum person, or for that matter, symphony, whatever, uh, cultural institutional person on the other. So that uh, unless we change the entire system, the entire system of society, there is simply no way to get away from this conflict. Uh, and occasionally the conflict gets out of hand and uh, uh, the uh, lay trustees, not knowing their place, uh, begin to meddle with uh, professionals and the professionals uh, being incompetent uh, invite such meddling. Uh, the uh, fault is not necessarily always on one side. Uh, How do you get along with your trustees? Very well, thank you. How many pictures have you sold during the 15 years that you've been here? Oh, maybe a hundred. Any regrets? No. Um, if, we, if we had the kind of endowment that would make this entirely unnecessary, I probably would have recommended fewer sales. I still would have sold quite a bit simply as a matter of house cleaning. Uh, there were things were sold, for instance, which have absolutely no part in our collection. We are a museum of 20th century painting and sculpture. Uh, we had uh, knickknacks from Mexico and uh, Oriental art and all sorts of things. Uh, Renaissance paintings got here in some way. I don't ask me how, but they were here. And uh, these things simply took up space and money, so there was absolutely no question about that. Uh, the uh, most dramatic sale, of course, was that of uh, a number, uh, uh, an important number of uh, Kandinsky's. And there the reasoning uh, which I proposed and which was accepted by the trustees was that we have to make up our minds whether we are going to be primarily a Kandinsky museum, in which case we should not sell one scrap and on the contrary, buy more Kandinsky's and, uh, and uh, retain this as our birthright, uh, or else uh, it is our ambition to be uh, a museum largely of 20th century art in which the best Kandinsky's would, uh, of course, occupy an honored place, and we decided in favor of the second. What is your favorite period? In all art history? Mm -hmm. Well, favorite, again, is a little difficult. I would, I would hate to give the implication that, that there could be anything more favored than Florentine painting of the 15th century or, or Greek art of the 5th uh, century BC or any number of marvelous areas. But uh, I have, uh, of course, unequal competence in, in these various fields, and uh, I'm most involved in the uh, uh, what is now considered historical modernism of the 20th century, in other words, in the first uh, half of the century. Well, obviously, list making is not very gratifying, nor is it definitive. But uh, who is your favorite artist? You ask me impossible questions. <laughs> I must give you at least a few. Please do. This will be held against me for the rest of my life. It may be, it may be a testimonial to your good judgment.
Well, again, without without saying that they are not others, uh, it would it would be difficult to uh, to name a figure <coughs> more moving and uh, uh, one that touches me personally more than Paul Clay, for instance. Um, whatever, however, I may admire, and I could easily mention a half dozen names. They would not. This admiration would not be in excess of Paul Clay. It would be of a different kind. There is no artist in the 20th century whose reach uh, is greater than Picasso and whose uh, genius has, uh, has greater uh, explosive power than his. Uh, the 20th century is literally not imaginable uh, without Picasso. And I don't mean only the painting of the 20th century or the sculpture, but life in our age would be different. Our, our visual sensibility, the appearance on the streets of, you know, of clothes, of everything would be changed if Picasso, and in a different sense, if Mondrian had not lived. Uh, there would never be a certain kind of architecture. There would never be a certain kind of design, a, a certain courage of coloristic expression but for Mondrian. Uh, so all of this uh, is, uh, is something that cannot be exceeded. But if you think of uh, Clay and uh, the uh, way in which he presented a world awareness, usually on very small surfaces, without any declamation, with the greatest modesty and economy of means, with uh, an almost religious ethic about everything that he does, then it is impossible to say that one loves anyone more than Clay. A number of people view the Guggenheim Museum as one of the finest pieces of outdoor sculpture in this city. As a museum director, how do you view it as an exhibition space? Uh, very positively, and uh, this is not a diplomatic answer, nor is it one that is shared by all of my colleagues. My predecessor, for instance, uh, found himself greatly bothered by the building, and it is uh, common knowledge that he and Frank Lloyd Wright engaged in nothing less than something close to fist fights. But uh, uh, I find the building marvelous in many, many ways. Uh, it is, of course, a great sculpture, but in being this, it sets a standard for any work of art that may accommodate itself within it. In other words, the building itself is a form uh, so perfect that it almost demands the presence of uh, works of high quality if these works are not to be uh, demo demolished by comparison, by visual comparison. Uh, I've argued this point before, and somebody told me, well, if this is so, if the Guggenheim is that infallible quality standard that we have all been seeking for the millennia, uh, then all we have to do is pick up a painting, carry it into the Guggenheim, and see what happens. If it looks great, it's great art. If it <laughs> isn't, we know that it's no good. And there is something to that. So I love the place. I don't find it uh, difficult, uh, no more difficult than exhibiting is in general. Uh, any presentation of a group of work requires a uh, great uh, visual acuteness and a great deal of work. But this is precisely the pleasure. And uh, I can think of many, many things in this place, and this is not a lead for you, uh, that are much less pleasant than installation. Installation is the great reward that uh, I have here. If you had it to do otherwise, what would you do differently? The Guggenheim Museum. Oh, I would have asked uh, Solomon uh, Guggenheim to plunk down a larger amount of money, <laughs> which he probably would have been happy to do. The strange thing is that when in 1937 he gave uh, 10 million, which I've appreciated since, uh, this uh, was something that was generous philanthropy, but it would have been just as easy to tell him that we need uh, 20 or 30 million, and he probably would have said, okay, 
The point is that at the time nobody could have imagined in his wildest dreams that even the ten could be spent and used, let alone more than that. Because he had not yet encountered a man of your taste and scale. Thank you, Tom Messer, director of the Guggenheim Museum, for spending an interesting and often entertaining hour with us. Thank you.